the first time you hear the word fear or afraid in the Bible. And, and it wasn't, you know, that God punished him or whatever. The bottom line is that he did something that separated himself from a relationship with the father. Amen. Adam was the first son. When I talk about sonship, ladies, understand that that, 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 it, that is not just talking about men. Are you with me? Sonship is pretty much in the generic because it's talking about children. So that's men and women. Amen. So, so when, he, when he did what he did, he separated himself from God. And from that point on, God's plan was to bring back his children to himself. Are you all with me? The primary reason that he died on the cross was to restore what the first Adam lost. I need you to hear this. I'm going to share some stuff. I know we all sighed, and some of you don't have your Bibles and so on. If you have your phones, get in on it. I'm going to share some very important information from the Bible. If it, if it wasn't that the Bible was, was so clear about God's purpose and plan, it'd be another thing. But the Bible is so clear. The reason that a lot of people don't know God's purpose and plan is because they don't read the Bible enough or they are not taught correctly. I, I, I was raised in a church. The only thing I knew about God is that if I messed up, that he was going to punish me. But I remember hearing that from my mom. I was brought up Catholic, and my mom would always say, you know, when I would do something wrong, she would say in Spanish, Papa Dios te va a castigar. In other words, God is going to punish you. Have you all ever heard that? God is going to punish you. So that's the only God I knew. And then when I came to church, Pentecostal church, they would say the same thing. You know what? God is not going to put up with you forever. Well, you know, that was a problem because there was no way in the world that I or you can be perfect. And the person that, that just thought I am perfect will pray for you. Amen. And, and so can you imagine trying to be perfect before God because you think that he's going to punish you if you're not? That is crazy. And that's why most people don't really have a real relationship with God. Because how, how is it possible to have a good relationship with God if you think he's watching over you er, to see how you do, and if you don't do well, boom. And I will hear people say, oh, man, I'm going through stuff. Uh, I'm paying for what I did. Well, listen, that's foolish. Because you can't pay what Christ already paid for. Is anybody here? You can't pay what he paid to even bring yourself to the point where you think that you can do something to make you righteous is foolishness. Are y'all here? So, uh, so God's plan was always to make us sons, sons and daughters. That was his plan. He said, the only way that I can do it is by giving my son to pay the price for them. Now, you have to understand that sonship is important, or daughtership. Why? Because I said last week, uh, uh, my grandkids, my daughter here, I mean, they're, they're my life. I'll do anything for them. Come on. Right? If, if they come to me and say, look, that this is what I need or, or whatever, I'm there, man. I'm a father. I never had a father when I was young. He left when I was very young. So I, ha I was kind of an orphan because I didn't have that person in my life. Last week, I talked about the mindset of an, of an orphan. An orphan thinks differently than a true son. An orphan thinks that they have to do something to please the father. Come on. They will go like, uh, God, I did something good, so now you can bless me. That, that's the wrong mentality because though my kids would do something wrong or not, I am there. I'm their father. That does not change. And if that's true about me or you that are human, how much more about our heavenly father? Come on. So I have a scripture I'm going to read. I'm going to read from the King James. I normally don't read from the King James because um, it's, just, it's just King James. Um, but I, I, I don't have the screen, so I have to read from my iPad. In John chapter 8, verse 29, if you do anything today, if you can take notes, at least take the scriptures down. Write them down. Amen? Romans 8, 29 says, For who, 
he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God's purpose is that we be conformed to his son. And the only way that you can be conformed uh, to the son, Christ, is to give your life to him and to trust him so that you can be one with him. Th is, is God's purpose? Is God's plan? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So here it is. So, then, so what we're seeing is that he wants us to be in the image of his son, and his son is in the image of his father. Are y'all getting this? That means, my friend, that, that, that as we are conformed into the image of his son, and all you got to do to be conformed into the image of the son is to accept him as your Lord and Savior, is to say, Lord, come into my life. I'm not perfect. Uh, I, I, I never will be perfect, but I accept what you did on the cross for me. When you do that, you are being conformed into the son. And to be conformed is a process, meaning uh, you, you immediately become like him. But then the process of understanding what that means takes a minute. Are you all here? And some people are still trying to find out what that means. But doesn't it blow your mind that he says that his purpose and, he, and that he predestinated us to be like his son. And then the, the next verse says that, that he is in the image of his father. And you know what? That's hard for people to receive. It's hard for people to take. Because it, 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 it's for you to admit that you are now one with Christ and the father. That's what it means to be a son. To be, to be like Christ and his father. Well, of course, that's so beyond us because we learned of a God that's way out there in the cosmos. We learned of a God that, that, that's, that's so far removed from us that, that we can't even, you know, it was true in the New Testament as well. The Jewish people could not even mention God's name because that was blasphemy. How dare you? But remember this, the only reason they wanted to kill Jesus the son it's not because he did miracles. It's not because of what he said. The time they wanted to kill him is because he identified himself as a son of the father. That's why religious people hate this message. Religious people rather put themselves in a position with, uh, 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 of guilt and so on, and then they try to please God. And then there's preachers from the pulpit that would get on people because they say, oh, you did this and you did that. Get right with God. What does that mean? Say 10 Hail Marys? What does that mean to be right with God? We do not have the ability to be right with God. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. We are right with God and we are his righteousness through Christ and Christ alone. Okay, this is good news, but looking at your face. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Amen. And so, and so it says. Give me one more. Okay. So, how do we become sons and daughters? Through adoption. I don't know if you understand the adoption system and so on. Come on down. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so the only way to become a son of God is through adoption. Do you understand that? When, when you get adopted in the Jewish uh, community, um, they change your name. Right? If your name was Ron and you get adopted by a Jewish family, they will change your name to what? To their name, right? And the same thing happens with us when we are adopted into the family of God. Our name is changed. Yeah, you, you can be Andre, and you can be Jalen, and, and so on, 
But as far as God is concerned, he changed your name into son. Come on. It's very important. So that whole process is biblical. We have to be adopted. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that was us, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The Bible is clear, man. The Bible is so clear. It tells us exactly what happens, how it happens, why it happens. When you're sitting there, and, and sometimes we go to church, we're sitting there, we're just hearing a message, and, but we're thinking about you know, different things, and uh, uh, we think about uh, issues that we're having in life and so on, and it doesn't, it doesn't become clear to us that this morning, sitting right here in our lawn in RLC, God is looking upon you as a son and a daughter. He loves you. He cares for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross that you may be adopted as sons and daughters. Now, how many parents do we have here? Amen. A lot of us are parents. You should understand this. You should understand this. Sometimes we understand the, the, the nuclear family or the, you know, the human family, we understand that more than God's family, you know, because it's hard for us, again, like I said before, to grab a hold of the fact that the Father, the one who created the heavens and the earth, he created the universe, I mean, he is all powerful, all of that, that he could be our Father. That's hard, but it's true. If you get this message, it will change your life. It will change your perspective because you will understand no matter what you face, the Father in heaven is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He wants to bless you. He wants to fix your problem and fix your issues simply because he loves you as a father. And he loved you so much, and he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave who? Come on. Well, if he can do that, how much more will he do for you? The issue, my friend, one of the biggest enemies of sonship is a lack of faith. It takes faith. To believe that almighty God is interested in me and is interested in my issues. He is interested in every single thing you go through no matter how big or how small. That's the way I am. And I'm human. Cassie, what's going on? My, my grandkids, I love them, man. To life. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm interested. What's, what's going on? I'm interested. Perhaps they need, you know, don't even try it. Perhaps they need, you know, they need $500 to, to fulfill their, their, their uh, uh, not rental, but their mortgage. You know what? If I don't have it, I'll get it. You're not hearing me. Am I the only one like that? Uh-uh. I'm not. You know where we got that from? His image. You know what we got? The love for our family and the idea that we would do anything for our family from the Father. Come on. Are you with me? And so it says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into the hearts crying, Abba, Father. My friend, that is intimacy. The word Abba means daddy. Come on. That's intimacy. Many times what the church lacks, we may have a great time in church, we may have a great time having church, but a lot of times what we lack is intimacy with the one that we have church for. Come on. He is Abba, Father, Daddy. Daddy, have you ever cried out to God? And you can say God, but the rightful term to cry out to God is Daddy because he is our Daddy. He's interested. Uh, it's sad to say that, 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 again, much of the church has lost 
that truth. We have church just to have church. Okay. And sometimes, my friend, they can't tell the, the church from the world. Because remember what happened with Adam and Eve. When they became orphans, their whole mindset changed. Prior to that, they would meet with God, have intimacy with God. They would talk with him. God put them in charge of the Garden of Eden, which was incredible. He said, all of this is yours. When they ate of the fruit, my friend, they, they had a, a, a paradigm shift in their thinking. Now they decided that they were going to protect themselves and provide for themselves. And you may be sitting there and saying, what's wrong with that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. What's wrong with that, my friend, is that when you make yourself the protector and the provider, then he can't. Hello. God will instruct us. God will tell us what to do. The Bible says if man doesn't work, he won't eat. I mean, we're not talking about that. We're talking about putting God first, putting the Father first. And then whatever we do at that point, my friend, he is behind it. He will bless it. Now, I guarantee you that in the world, there's tons of people who are depressed. They are saying that depression is the next pandemic. Hello? And, and I can understand that. What I can't understand, that the church would be just as depressed as the world. Hey. It ought not to be that way because we serve a God that loves us and cares for us. He is our protector. He is our provider. Come on. But what happens is that we try to take that role from God. And when we try to take that role from God, then it's on us. And I can guarantee you, my friend, that the things of this world and the things of the kingdom you cannot carry only Jesus can carry it if I am conformed into his image now I can carry it oh you're not hearing me you're not hearing me praise the Lord Manny are you somewhere can you pre please run to Starbucks and get these folks some coffee some double shots at them. <laughs> amen Verse 7 says in Galatians chapter 4, Wherefore, you are no more a servant or a slave. Are you with me? You are no. Now listen, be it, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it doesn't matter what the Bible says. It's what you think that makes you. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we hear, it says here, so you are no longer servants, but sons. And our mind is thinking, no, I still, I still got to do this. So then the word becomes nullified because it has to be how you think. It has to be what you believe. When you hear the word of God, you go like, man, that, that sounds too good to be true, but I'm going to believe it. And then starts the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind is subject to what we start believing. Come on. And, and you know it's true. I mean, you can hear. And God will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And then right after, you, yeah, right, we'll go like, praise the Lord. And then right after, you go like, shoot, how am I going to pay this bill? Because what God says has to supersede how you think. Come on. And when you dare to have faith and you dare to say, I am a son, though I don't deserve it. I, I am a son, even though I, I, I'm not perfect. I am a son, even though I messed up yesterday. But I am a son because he says that I am. I am no longer a slave. I'm no longer a servant. I am a son. The battle, my friend, is right here. You know it as well as I do. You can hear all kind of stuff from the word of God, but it doesn't mean that it's automatic. Come on. Because the minute that you dare to believe God, that's when the battle starts. 
and it's not a battle against the devil. He's already defeated. It's a battle in the mind. Well, I hear what that Puerto Rican pastor saying, but but uh, he don't know my situation. I'm not saying it, my friend. I'm reading it from the word of God. God has said it. And the Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. But he needs people to believe it. And if we don't believe it, my friend, nothing changes. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think you're poor, you're going to be. If you think you're weak, you're going to be. If you, Oh, you're not hearing me. Amen. Praise him, praise him. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. All you got to do is sit there and listen. I do the work. Amen. Just believe. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again, uh, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. This is the good part, y'all. Then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, if, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. It's awesome. Not only are you a son, but because you are a son, have been adopted as a son or a daughter, now you are an heir. You know how many people, man, they, they, they're like broke. You know, they're going like, man, I don't know what to do. I just lost my job and so on. Then they get a letter in the mail of somebody, an uncle or something that they, they, they don't even remember, vaguely remember. The letter says that that uncle died and made you an heir. Do you know what that means? That means that whatever the uncle had is now rightfully that person's. Would you agree that's the way it works? Yeah. And so it's saying here, if you are a son or a daughter, you are automatically heirs with him. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Again, the battle is in the mind. I, you know, mama didn't raise no fool. I know I'm, I'm sharing the truth of the word of God, but I'm there with you. It's not that easy to get it because it's, it's fighting against Years and years and years of wrong thinking. Or, you know, as they say, stinking thinking. That's basically what it is. But we're believing that Holy Spirit is going to help us today. We believe that Holy Spirit is going to cause us to rise up and to have faith and to believe and to understand that no matter what we're facing, we are heirs with Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. It just blows you away. <coughs> Amen. Hold on one second. Amen. Joint heirs with Christ. What does that mean? Hebrews chapter. 1 verse 2, listen carefully. That he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, who he has appointed heir of all things. Now, wait a minute. If he is heir of all things, and I am a joint heir with him. Yeah. The devil is a liar, too. Amen. Boy, Did you hear what I just said? You should be standing on your feet. Just like I said, when you hear good news, whether it's a team winning or, or you just won $50 in the lotto, don't do it. I mean, you'll be like, yes! And here we're hearing that Jesus is an heir to all things. Not some things, all things. And then it says, and you are a joint 
heir with him. That means you are one with him. That means you have everything that he has. Oh, there we go again, though. Bing, bing, bing. Well, if that's true, how come I'm broke? Bing. No, my friend, it, because you believe you're broke. Okay, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. So it says that he, uh, that he was appointed heir of all things by who also he made the worlds. Now, here it is. James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of the world rich in faith? In other words, you can be poor in this world, but rich in faith. Come on. If you're rich in faith, your situation will change. Come on, right? So he says that he has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. So what are we heirs of? The kingdom. Problem, though. Let me say potential problem. The kingdom of God runs concurrent with the kingdom of this world. Are, are you all with me? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world coexist. The only reason that we don't operate in the kingdom as much as we should is because it is invisible. Somebody say invisible. You can't see it. But that's the whole idea of faith. Because faith, my friend, what does, what does it say? That faith, we walk by faith and not by, we're going to say that again. We walk by and not by, so that's the issue. If you walk by faith, my friend, you, you are walking in the kingdom. And if you are an heir of the kingdom, there is no lack in the kingdom of God. That, oh, you ain't here. And you know what's the good, good news about this? The good news is that you are even though you don't deserve it. Don't ever measure yourself before God based on who you are or what you've done. Because God will never, ever bless you with the kingdom if it was up to you. Come on. He made you a son and a daughter in spite of you. He gave you, he made you an heir of all things in the kingdom in spite of you. All you need to do is believe it. But I will say that Paul was correctly when he wrote to his son Timothy. And he said, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Yes, it is a fight. It is, yes. And that's why most of us do not get into the fight. Because we've gone through so much that we don't want to fight no more. Hey, we get lazy in the fight. But the only true battle, my friend, is the battle of faith. Paul didn't say, hey, Timothy, you better, you better, come on, man, you better rise up and fight that devil. Fight him, fight him. Fight the devil. Like many of us heard. He said, no, no, your issue is not the devil because the devil has been defeated. Jesus Christ defeated the devil on the cross. He made him a... And if you're still fighting the devil, my friend, that's the problem. Because you can't fight the devil and have faith at the same time. Because faith will always express itself in what you say. And if you talk more about the devil, you have faith in the devil more than God. I must say it. It's the truth. He said, no, 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 listen to me. Fight the good. He didn't say just fight the fight. Fight the good. It's a good one, my friend. Have you ever been in a good fight? Come on. I'm not talking about just physically. I'm talking about a, a fight emotionally, mentally. And he's saying your fight is spiritually. It is a fight of faith. Can I tell you why he wrote that to him? 
Many of you who've been to our church, you've probably heard it before. But Timothy pastored the largest church of his time. It's the first mega church in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to him, and he's telling him, listen, man, this is how you organize a church. I know that you're growing like crazy, but, you know, you need to, to put in some elders and put in some deacons so that they can help the growth of the church say good times. It was good times. They were growing, man, like crazy. People were excited. The Corinthian church was known as the most gifted church of its time. It was flowing in the gifts. I mean, they were partying. Then all of a sudden, Nero said, well, I'm going to put a stop to all this stuff. And the, and the great persecution started. And you can read this in history books. And he said, everybody that says they're Christians, they have to die. And they started killing Christians. Oh, you're not hearing me. They, they developed the most cruel ways of torturing Christians. They would drop them in a vat full of hot oil. They would send them down the slide with a blade down the middle. That by the time they reached the bottom, they were sewn in half. They would, they would tie them up to horses. And they were ripped apart. I know it sounds crazy. But you're blessed in the U.S. Don't even know it. And because I travel, man, I travel to Burma where they can put you in prison. Uh, it doesn't matter how long. They say just because you preach the gospel. I've been there. I've preached the gospel there. Somebody says, aren't you jeopardizing your, li your life? Yes, but I'm jeopardizing my life for my God. I used to jeopardize my life in a gang and all that kind of stuff, and I can't do it for God? Well, you're not hearing me. So now things were bad, and things turned around quickly because the church, uh, 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 Timothy wrote to Paul and said, Paul, I think I shrunk the church. I'm only kidding. <laughs> he didn't say that. But the church shrunk, and there was persecution now. Now Paul writes to him and says, hey, man, I know you had a good run, and I know it's rough, but let me tell you this. Now is the time to fight the good fight of faith. I don't know what you're going through, man. I don't know what your situation is. The tendency is to trust the world, and the tendency is to look to the world to be our source. I don't know what you're going through. It could be marriage issues, financial issues. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. If it's bad, fight the good fight of faith. Keep trusting. Keep believing. Keep confessing that you are a son and a daughter. Keep letting God know that you are an heir and you deserve everything that is rightfully yours. That's the fight of faith. Are you all here? Can you give me a few more minutes? Who said, yep, with authority? Ken, that's my man right there. That's right. I remember one time when the, panda the pandemic was really uh, uh, on, man. I mean, everything was shut down and people, I mean, you remember? I mean, it's still on, but I mean, it was really heavy. And, um, and we decided, you know, we're not going to close the church, man. Let them say what they want to say. I'm going to do this by faith. I'm not going to listen to the voice of man. I'm going to listen to the voice of God because I'm crazy like that. And I told the church, well, you know, whoever wants to come, we're here. I didn't tell them to come. I said, whoever wants to come. So these guys would come and, and Ken. And I remember I'm going on Facebook, and, uh, and I saw this, this uh, what, what do they call it, where it's like a little video. Come on, some of you know. So, some of you are Facebook freaks, and you just... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for telling on yourself. So, <laughs> so he was on there, and he stopped, and he screamed, freedom. But so much so that whoever heard it got free. He, he may not know that, but when I heard it, I was like, yes. He did it out on the street, by the way, not in his house. That's why I said, that's my guy right there. 
Amen. Listen, amen, amen. And so, it's a fight. Now, what robs us of our inheritance, meaning you already have an inheritance. You already have an inheritance. Now, it's only by faith that you can tap into it. Are you with me? You already have it. No, no, you don't have to fast 40 days and you don't have to, you know, do this and that. You already have it. It's, it's his gift to his sons. Are you with me? But the thing that will stop us from receiving the inheritance is found in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to it. Listen to it. It says, now I say, though you are an heir. Are y'all still with me? As long as he is a child, he is no different than a slave, though he be Lord of all. Whoa. So it, he didn't say, this is what you have to do to become an heir. He said, though you are an heir. Though you are an heir. Are y'all here? God owns all the money in the world, my friend. You are an heir to that. He is the healer. You are an heir to that. Are you with me? But, but what Paul said, Paul said, now listen, though you are an heir, because you're still immature, you are no different than a slave. Oh, yes and amen. So, Immature in what sense? My friend, the only way that you can measure your growth in God is not by how long you've been saved. It's not how many times you go to church. The way, the only way you can measure your growth in God is by the level of your faith. I'm going to say it again. Somebody said, yeah, 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 how dare you talk to me like that? I've been saved since 1608, you know, whatever. And it's like, you know what? I don't care how long you've been coming to church. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. Where is your faith? Your faith level will determine, my friend, your growth and maturity in Christ. I'm going to challenge you. Then you came to church just to eat my food? <laughs> uh, are, are you with me? Yeah. So what he was saying, look. That you are an heir? No question. You are. But the only reason that you don't know you are is because you still think like a child. You don't, you, you don't have the faith to grab a hold of what is rightfully yours. Come on. And sometimes, my friend, we just have to anchor down. We're going to have to push the thinking of the world and, and, and stop putting our trust in the world. They're not our protectors. They're not. Come on. They're not our providers. God is. And though we are in this world, we are not of this world. Come on. And we have to have faith in God. You have to believe God for more. You have to be, believe God for miracles. You have to believe God for more than what you need so that you can be a blessing. It is up to you. Oh, yeah, well, I know. Well, I know God blessed that person. I'm not sure he wants to bless me. As a man thinks in his heart, stop thinking like that. You deserve everything that God has for you. And some people say, you know, I'm just waiting on God. Well, how long have you been waiting? The Bible says hope deferred sickens the heart. And you've been waiting for God. For what? God is waiting for you. God is saying you already are an heir. Come on. The Bible says that we have been healed by what? His stripes 2,000 years ago. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to heal me. Come on. He already did it. The issue is who you are going to believe. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what God is saying and apply your faith? And when it gets hard and your mind starts working against what, what you're believing, and, but you go like, oh, oh, oh. Where, where, where's my? She's back there somewhere. She told me, Pastor, 
You know you're not supposed to curse in church. <laughs> yeah, so I'll say it anyway. Hell no. It's true. You, you, no, listen to me. When the battle starts, my friend, listen, it is you and you alone and your faith alone with God that you have to go like, no. I say no to poverty. I say no to sickness. Why? Because I am a son. I am a daughter. And, is, and I am rightfully an heir to the things that Jesus purchased on the cross. How many of y'all willing to fight today? Come on, if you're willing to fight, give the Lord a good hand. Come on. If you're not willing to fight, do not complain. Amen. Praise him, praise him. Okay. Oof. So I'm going to close with this verse. The Bible says in Romans chapter 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Say in us. So he didn't say compared to the glory that we will see. He said compared to the glory that's in us. Do you realize that Christ is in you? The day you accepted Jesus Christ, he came into your heart. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come on, y'all here. Right? So he's referring that, that the, the, the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Watch it. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. I mean, God is so smart. And, he, you know, he's all wisdom. He said the only way, you remember Jesus came to do what? To save the world. He grabbed 12 people. And he discipled them. Listen to me. Get the idea of discipleship. He discipled 12. He didn't try to disciple masses. He said, if I can get 12 and I can be a spiritual father to them, we can do this thing. Are you all here? And now he is saying that the creation, the world, is crying out and is waiting. Say waiting. It is waiting for the manifestation of of the sons. You know, we, we get to pray, Lord, save the world, save the world. You're a son. They're waiting for you. Lord, save my family, save my family. You're a son, you're a daughter. They're waiting for you. Oh, you're not hearing me. West Chicago, Wheaton, all this area, my friend, they are crying out. And they're waiting for the manifestation, the revelation of sons and daughters. The word manifestation there. Ooh, the sun is getting deep. The word manifestation there means to take off the cover. Meaning that sons and daughters, the only reason the world doesn't know that we are is because we are covered well, you're here. Whether you know it or not, my friend, he is alluding to something so powerful. What he's alluding to is what happened with Adam when he became an orphan. And he, wait, he went and covered himself with fig leaves. And though we are sons and daughters, many of us are still covered with fig leaves. We are still covered by our own thinking. We're still covered by our own strength. We're still covered by our own ways. He says, you're a son. You're just covered. And the world is waiting for the uncovering of the sons and daughters. And that's us. If you attend RLC, I'm speaking to you more than anybody else. It's time that we rise up. It's time that we take the fig leaf off and say, you know what? I'm a son. I'm a daughter. 
We won't be afraid to speak to a world that's crying out and say, you know what? I'm a son of God, and you can be too. I'm a daughter, and you can be too. They're waiting. They're waiting for the manifestation. Wow. I feel like Stevie Wonder right there. It's the truth. If you're not part of our RLC, listen, man, I have no authority to share with you the way that I do. But if you got something today, man, receive it. If you're looking for a church where you can be planted as a son and a daughter, RLC is it. We're not afraid to preach the truth. The bottom line is that we are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the Christ on the earth. And a prayer that has not been answered yet is the prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17. He said, Father, that as we are one, that you will make them one with us. You hear me? He said that, that, that I can be in you and you in me and they in me. And because of that, they're in you. He was talking about oneness. That is his goal. And this is the mind-blowing thing. And this is, to me, is tied into religion. That is called identification. It's where we get the word identity from. What he was saying, let them identify with us. They are one with us. Y'all need to hear me. No matter what you think about yourself, you have to realize that you're one with God. You are a son and a daughter. There are people who are afraid to identify. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father, and they hated that. But I'm here to tell you right now, if you see me, you see Christ. And if that's not true, my friend, hang it up. Because we are the only Christ on the earth. We are sons and daughters. People ought to know. They ought to hear our faith. They, they should see that we are powerful, that we are willing to believe God for miracles. They should see that because that, that's what Christ does. I want to pray for us. This is one of the most powerful messages found in the Word of God. You not, you're not who you think you are. You are who he says you are. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you did above and beyond what we know and what we understand. But, Lord, we are people of faith. And we say in the name of Jesus, and we declare by faith that we are sons and daughters, we're going to hold our heads up high. We're going to realize, Father, that you have given us all things. We have authority. We have dominion. Everything belongs to us. We are heirs. And now we lay claim to everything that's ours. We're going to believe you, Lord, for the finances. Not only what we need, but above and beyond what we need so we can be a blessing to somebody else. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that when you look upon us, you don't see our faults. You don't see anything but the glory of the Son in us. You love us, O oh God, and we thank you. Let us leave here ready, equipped to fight the good fight of faith. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Would you say this with me as we close? Let's start with the men say, I am a son. Please say it like you mean it. 
Amen. Count on three. One, two, three. I, I am, am a son. Yeah, let's try that again. See, I don't, I don't play around, right? I'm a diehard Steeler fan. Come on. That's who I identify with. It. The Bears, they're okay. <laughs> but you think that I tried to hide that I'm a Steeler fan? I even got Steeler sneakers. No, no. Listen, I want people to know, man, he's a Steeler fan. Right? So when you believe something, you're not afraid to identify with it. You're not afraid to shout it out. If you believe you're a son at the count of three, I want you to shout it out so West Chicago can hear you. Ready? Come on. One, two, three. I, I am a son. Come on. Yeah. Now watch this. Now watch it now. I'm, I'm going to the women, and I'm going to tell you right now, men, they're going to put you to shame. I just know it. I just know it. Amen. Come on, women. You're a daughter. You know you're a daughter. You know you're an heir. At the count of three, women, I want you to shout it out. I am a daughter. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. I told you. I told you. <laughs> I, hey, but we're getting there, y'all. We're getting there. The men are going to be the ones that shout the loudest. Watch. Hear me. Amen. Listen, I love you guys. Thank you for coming, hearing the word of God. Please apply your faith to the word. Amen. Things are going to change. The last thing I'm going to do is receive today's offering. Amen. And it's pretty simple. Though they, they have, if, if you want to write a check or something like that, they have something, a bucket that they'll pass around. But there's easier ways to give. You can give online. And you probably say, why do churches take offerings? I'm glad you asked. Because you realize that it takes money to have a church and to support missions all over the world. Our church supports missions all over the world. We don't believe in keeping everything here. Amen. We're going to be going to Nicaragua soon, and uh, we pay for all the expenses, and we bless them because it's what we do. So if you want to give online and so on, there it is. Amen. Uh, and all I can say is stick around. Let's, let's do the picnic. Amen. And let's be blessed. Uh, oh, yeah. No, no, we have baptism yeah. real quick. Amen.